not so much. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about supply chains, and what I mean is just um, where does stuff come from, and how does it get to us. Um, and in particular, I'm going to illustrate that with uh, challenges and changes uh, in two supply chains. First, uh, toilet paper, and the second, food. Um, and then I'll touch on what do I think could be some permanent changes that will continue after the pandemic. Okay, so first, uh, toilet paper. Let's have a show of hands, anyone who's encountered a shortage of toilet paper uh, at the grocery store. It's a pretty, pretty common occurrence. So the question is, why is there a shortage? Um, well, for sure, there's been a spike in consumption. And you can explain that through psychological uh, reasons. Uh, think snowstorms, think maybe we're just trying to control one small aspect of our lives in this uncertain time. I think more interesting is there are also rational reasons why we as consumers want to increase the stock of toilet paper that we have at home. And I think that subconsciously, uh, we're all applying a very uh, uh, sound mathematical formulas, if you will, to decide how much of this product we need in our houses. So I took the standard formulas that are used by companies to stock their warehouses and applied it to our situation at home in the pandemic. And the amount you would want, logically, is based on a couple of things. One is your consumption. So we know that we're not going to school, we're not going to work, we're not going to restaurants, therefore we are consuming more toilet paper at home, maybe 50% or so more than usual. And on the other hand, the cost of the purchase occasion as perceived by us has really gone up. It's you know scary to go to the grocery store now, so we don't wanna go very often because of that, which is perfectly logical. And when we do go, we're gonna buy more. And the other factor is safety stock. Once we've been to stop and shop three or four times and there isn't anything on the shelf, we logically conclude that um, the ability to resupply the product is gonna be very difficult. And that drives us toward wanting to build a very substantial safety stock. When we ran some numbers, we saw that this might induce consumers to want to buy anywhere between 10 times as much as normal and maybe 30 times as much as normal. So no wonder uh, there are some stock outs on the shelf. Okay, on the supply side, supply is pretty fixed in the short run. Uh, these uh, toilet paper is made at very large factories uh, around the country. They're already working uh, three shifts before the pandemic. Uh, fortunately, illness hasn't closed these plants to any great degree yet, but it's not easy for them to ramp up. I think what's most interesting, though, about toilet paper is it turns out there are um, two very distinct kinds of product here. They are made in different factories. Um, they are uh, packaged in different packages, and they're handled through different distribution channels. Uh, so um, that's a major challenge for us here. There are uh, big plants in the consumer um, production area, Procter & Gamble, for instance, which makes uh, the Charmin uh, toilet paper at a giant plant in Mahoopany, Pennsylvania, on the uh, shores of the uh, Susquehanna River. Um, is, is, is going flat out. And I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that this is my very favorite brand. If you have some of this at home, you're a very happy camper. Uh, Maureen did find it at Market Basket. So, so that's, um, that's exciting. But there's a second product and a separate second channel, and that is the bulk, the wholesale, the industrial channel, which serves food service, it serves restrooms and in, in office buildings, etc. For some plants, it could be possible to switch from the industrial product to the consumer product, but it would take investment. And um, interesting article saying that Kimberly Clark makes Kleenex and um, uh, Cottonelle and, and other uh, brands of, of tissue uh, is looking for the first time in a detailed epidemiological projections in order to figure out, you know, how long will this extraordinary demand last and can they justify uh, an investment in switching over um, a plan. Uh, on the other hand, there are crossovers in the channel, and this is just so uh, interesting to me and, and very unusual, uh, as you saw in the, in the picture there uh, that went out. 
uh, we're now seeing uh, in the industrial product, which uh, here, here's an example. Uh, you can get four of these at a, at a shot over at uh, Wilson Farm. And this is you know, very intriguing. One stop and shop had nothing on the shelf. Wilson had the product. They had added it exceptionally. When I spoke with Jim Wilson, he said, hey, we're, we're nimble. Our buyers get up early in the morning. We, we find this stuff and, and we put it out on the shelf to um, help people out. Well, when will this shortage end? It will end when one of four things happens. Uh, first, maybe production will ramp up sufficiently. Uh, second, maybe there'll be enough of this crossover between the industrial and the consumer channel. A third, maybe we'll all be satiated. We will have reached our, our desired new inventory level. Uh, or fourth, we'll go to the store and we'll see that there's plenty of it and, and that'll be the end of the crisis and it'll stop suddenly. So, you know, when that happens, I'm not sure, but I would say for toilet paper, it's probably a matter of weeks, although it might fluctuate going forward. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the food supply chain. Again, we have the challenge posed here in the system by the absolute collapse uh, of demand in the food service uh, institutional channel. So uh, for farmers, for instance, who are geared up to serve restaurants, uh, it's, it's, a real, uh, it's a real disaster at the moment. Uh, but let's walk through the supply chain. If we start with production, um, the first point is uh, food is basically domestically produced in this country. 85% of all the food we eat uh, is produced, grown and produced in the United States, although that varies, obviously, bananas, coffee, blueberries in winter. Um, but there are challenges, uh, especially with large plants that have certain activities in the plant that are quite labor intensive and where workers need to typically stand close together. And I'm talking here about meat processing. Um, what's happened with meat is that due to desire for efficiency, we wound up with very, very large meat processing plants. 90% of the production of meat in this country is done in factories that process more than 1 million animals uh, per year. So these are vast plants employing thousands of people. Uh, and we have seen now a number of plant closures due to illness in places like Iowa, uh, Missouri, companies like Smithfield, Tyson, uh, et cetera. At present, almost one third of US pork capacity is, is out of service. Uh, so when we figure that in the country there's maybe two weeks worth of meat in cold storage facilities, and that these plants may need to be closed uh, for two weeks, in order to disinfect the plants and for workers to, to recover and so on, it's likely that we'll have some meat shortages. I'd say it's a very good time to become a vegetarian. Um, of course, fruits and vegetables are not immune. We know that we have uh, migrant workers, many undocumented uh, immigrants working out there in the fields. Not so much of a problem for planting, but when we get to the harvest this summer, uh, we have to hope that the uh, virus is more under uh, control. It is also more decentralized than, than meat, so that's a good thing. It, it's interesting that now our, the nation's pickers and packers are, are called essential workers, so uh, that's great. And, and it's, it's nice to see some uh, attention given to these workers, whether in newspaper articles, there was also a television ad recently by Kraft Heinz where they took you inside one of the plants and, and the workers were visibly quite proud of the job they're doing, uh, cranking out the uh, uh, Kraft uh, mac and cheese and the, uh, and the Heinz uh, ketchup. Um, but, um, you know, in many fields and plants, we're looking here at very socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, workers. And there's a whole set of issues that need to be addressed around that. Okay, turning to distribution, again, there are these two channels, the industrial channel and the, uh, and the uh, consumer channel. About half of all the food we eat is consumed away from home and the other half uh, in the home. There's also a third channel, which is food banks. And that channel is in trouble right now. There's less excess from the grocery stores to provide uh, to the food banks. And of course, the, the rise in demand has been dramatic. So that's a uh, a channel that we need to um, uh, support and, and think about in these times. 
There is crossover as there is with toilet paper. We see examples, of course, restaurants uh, pivoting to um, the pickup and delivery. We also see small scale producers around the country, uh, ranging from uh, fishermen who formerly supplied restaurants in San Francisco, uh, now willing to, to make home deliveries uh, direct to consumer. You see people foraging wild mushrooms in California and Colorado, again, uh, looking to go direct uh, to consumer. I'd like to mention a major change that has driven some of the stockouts we see in the grocery stores. And that is that over the last three or four decades, the retail uh, merchants have really gotten into the just-in-time mentality. So their, their, their concept is, I don't wanna hold any inventory. You, Mr. Manufacturer, you, know, you take the hit, you carry this stuff. Our margins are very slim, we can't afford it, we don't want it, it's all gonna be very nimble and quick. Well. Different companies run their supply chains differently. In Atlanta, for instance, if you go into a Kroger's, you might find that there's some pretty bare shelves uh, because their fulfillment from their warehouses has only been about 50% or so in recent days to their, to their store shelves. On the other hand, in the same area, Publix has a different strategy where they do use a, a distributor to hold stock for them, and as a result, there's plenty of product on the shelf. You can see some of those differences here in the Boston area. Of course, it varies from day to day, but in general, I would say places like Market Basket appear to have a, a different supply chain management and uh, stop and shop. Just want to touch on drivers. We know that about two thirds of everything that moves around in the United States is moved by trucks. Uh, drivers have been declared uh, essential workers. Uh, they've got a newfound found pride, I would say, in their job. Uh, turnover is down. Uh, and I don't really see a problem with trucking because the demand for other products in the economy is down so much that that has freed up capacity uh, to serve. Uh, serve the it, and finally, in terms of the consumption experience, the retail shopping experience that, that we all have, um, I would say in particular, we're seeing empty shelves uh, for three things. Paper products, as we mentioned earlier, uh, baking supplies. And so this is the, the phenomenon of, of all these guys that used to be at the office and now they're home. What are they doing? They're either growing beards uh, or they're baking bread. Okay, so, so that's why the yeast and the flour, I, I think, is not available. And the other thing that's in sometimes a short supply in the grocery stores are comfort foods. So think chips and dip and ice cream. And I would just like to say that this product uh, is available over at Stop and Shop. It's very good with some hell of a good dip. So just want to mention that for your, uh, your consideration. Um, okay, uh, the other thing we're gonna see is in general, there will be less selection. So for factories to increase their output in this time of, of very high demand, they're going to reduce the number of individual items that they produce to be as efficient as they can. And that's why you just aren't necessarily gonna see as much choice for certain uh, consumer goods on the shelf. But you know, when you, when you go to Wilson Farm, uh, their produce aisles are stocked. And they've been very, I think, imaginative in offering, in addition, uh, toilet paper and hand sanitizer. Uh, Jim Wilson says, very strong demand for the paper. Well, what kind of lasting changes uh, do we foresee? I, I, I see um, five major things that could last. The first is a, just a general de-risking of the supply chain. The pendulum has swung so far over towards low cost, just in time, it's gonna have to shift back uh, some towards lower risk, and that would be true at many different levels. For governments, I think that the need for better contingency planning, um, a more coordinated response management to viruses and other sorts of crises, if we compare the federal states collaboration in Australia, for instance, against what it's been in this country, uh, it's quite, uh, quite striking. So there's work there. Uh, as well as the development of uh, federal contracts for, uh, for drug supplies when the vaccine is eventually developed, et cetera. So there's, there's things to do there. Um, for companies, uh, there's gonna be a lot more attention given to supply chain risk planning. There'll be more localization, less reliance on far-flung supply chains uh, from China, less concentration in huge factories, more spread out approach. 
um, uh, people like Hershey, uh, for instance, the uh, CEO there, Michelle Buck, uh, you know, laid in supplies of raw materials and finished goods uh, very early on in the crisis. Um, when we uh, look at a uh, Kimberly Clark, we know they're doing some very sophisticated planning. I also expect to see better sensing and control tools um, deployed by companies so they can get a handle on things that are perturbing demand or supply much earlier in these kinds of crises. There's lots to be done for workers. Uh, I think we mentioned that, and they certainly deserve our thanks from, from fuckers to, um, to uh, grocery store clerks and, um, and farm workers. And at the household level, uh, I think we all have a new uh, view, uh, appreciation of the value of preparedness and, and safety. A second trend I see staying with us is online ordering and home delivery. I think that's here to stay. When you consider last year, grocery was the product group that had the very lowest penetration of e-commerce, online ordering. Only 2% of groceries last year were ordered online versus you know, consumer electronics, probably, you know, 20, 30% or more. Well, that's changing very fast. Uh, what was once a phenomenon limited to well-to-do young uh, urban professional folks in New York City, uh, all of a sudden, those of us in our 70s or 80s and, and, and so on are placing these orders and figuring out we can do it. Whether we can snag a delivery a slot is another question, but we're finding that, yes, it's, it's a very uh, useful. So. Uh, that's here to stay, and the um, role of companies like Instacart, Amazon, uh, Fresh Direct, uh, Mercado is, is going to take a, a step function leap uh, forward at, at this time. The third item I see uh, change would be uh, growing local solutions. I, I am convinced that smaller players that are nimble, like a Wilson Farm, uh, our access to farmers markets uh, as we have here in Lexington, and increased uh, grower solutions going direct to consumers. Uh, I think that's a change that is here uh, to stay and, and a good one. The fourth change I see is automation, both at production plants uh, and at uh, stores and fulfillment uh, centers. Um, these are trends that were already underway, but they're getting a huge boost when we see the shutdown of plants due to too many workers in too close confinement. Uh, it will, I think, encourage investment in automation. Some very interesting solutions now also to allow grocery stores to put a small scale um, automated uh, picking system in the back room, which would allow a faster fulfillment of online orders uh, than they can do at present by having pickers run up and down the aisle. Um, and finally, I just think there's going to be all kinds of new business models that are going to pop up uh, based on this uh, crisis, which are just so, so interesting. We don't know what they are yet. You know, will they involve uh, drones? Will they involve uh, self-driving vehicles to deliver these things to our homes? Uh, I, I'm convinced there'll be many interesting new business models that come out of it. So let me uh, stop there. Uh, thank you very much. I'll pass it back to you, Sarah. Thank you, David. That was very interesting. And now we open the, the floor for questions. So if you would like to, to ask a question, please raise your hand by the, uh, in the participants list. Do we have any questions for David? On the participants list. Marty? Yes. Um, I have a question, David. Yes, Mark. What's wrong with the supply chain that farmers are dumping all their milk and plowing under all their, the, so many of their products, their produce, while we've got people that are starving? What, yeah. that's a real disconnect for me. I don't understand how that can be and it can it be fixed. It, it is, Marty. I, I feel that's one of the most dramatic uh, scenes we've seen play out on, on TV and in the newspapers is uh, milk being dumped and, and crops being plowed under. So I think that in the short run, what it means is that these are products that were destined to that other channel, to the food service channel, to restaurants and so on. 
And they can't, you know, this is all based on contracts and arrangements and so on. And those farmers have not been able to pivot to either, you know, supply that to grocery stores or more to your point, to food banks, you know, when there are people going hungry. The, the challenge I, I, I saw in one case is you know, they don't have the, the workforce you know, to, to do the packaging. You know, these are bulk materials. These are truckloads of onions or vast quantities of, of milk. They aren't packaged in a suitable format to provide uh, to people. So I do think it'll it'll change a bit over time, but of course that's not either a sustainable uh, solution for those farmers to, to give their their product away forever. But it's very hard to see that. I agree. Tim Tricobi. Hey David, David, thank you very much. It's very good, very good presentation. Appreciate that. Uh, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on you know the supply chain for personal protective equipment and whether whether what what in what ways will it change? I assume it will change, but in what ways will that likely change as we look forward to our ne next uh, virus? Yes, I think the PPE, the medical supplies, is a very interesting case. It's more complex, more difficult, and one reason is there's just a lot more components. So, you know, a modern ventilator is a lot of electronics in it. There's many, many components. And uh, uh, to crank up the production of something like that is, is difficult um, because of, you know, you, you, you get 99% uh, of the parts and then one, you can't find a supply of it because everybody's chasing after the same component. It doesn't do any good. I've been quite heartened to see that everything from big companies to small people uh, have jumped in. It was great to see General Motors uh, put out its first uh, ventilator uh, very quickly. Um, another interesting case is um, the old Brooklyn Navy Yard down in New York has been transformed into a bunch of small uh, players, little manufacturers. And they've teamed up with engineers from MIT to develop a design for a simplified ventilator and they're uh, producing those. I even have some friends who run a greeting card company here in the Boston area called Love Pop Cards. I don't know if you've seen them. It's a very interesting. Uh, and they are uh, developing and, and uh, producing uh, face, um, face shields and so on uh, in, their, um, in their factory in, in Vietnam. So they're, you know, people are rallying uh, for sure, uh, but it, it caught us very flat-footed. I'd say everything from uh, uh, masks, respirator masks, even though our granddaughters are now uh, making some nice masks, which is good. But, um, you know, very flat-footed. If you look at the number of ICU beds per capita in Germany, you know, way, way above what, what other countries uh, have had, and the, uh, the early uh, emphasis on uh, uh, putting tests out there so you could localize the problem. You know, I do see that the federal government has... Uh, gone into some contracts to assure uh, manufacturing capability when a vaccine is developed. So hopefully a de vaccine will uh, you know, be proven effective in the coming months. And at that point, then there's a the question of manufacturing millions, if, if not billions of, uh, of doses of this uh, you know, uh, vaccine. So that's another big challenge. But it's a tough one. I think it's, it's, uh, it's harder. And there's some encouraging progress, but it's um, it's a pretty uh, pretty sobering reality. We have David Rose. Hi, it's Ruth. Actually, hi, David. Uh, this was just terrific. Um, the question I have is, what do you think we will have lost when uh, life goes back to so-called normal? Well, many things, I'm sure, uh, but in, in terms of um, in terms of the supply chain, and in terms of maybe our shopping experiences, I, I think it's going to likely be different for quite some time, unless and until we develop a vaccine or we discover that 90% of the population already has had the uh, uh, the virus. Uh, I just I, I just think that uh, restaurant dining is gonna is gonna 
be curtailed. Uh, it, it can continue, but if you space those tables apart and so on, it, it's going to be tough. The price point is going to go up. Now, on the other hand, take out, uh, drive through, uh, these sorts of things, the McDonald's of this world, I, I think, uh, you know, that is a, a feasible solution. And, and, and there's local restaurants here. Um, I don't know, 80 Thoreau out in Concord comes to mind, very nice place, and you can you can go pick it up. They'll drop it right in your trunk. Um, on the shelves and so on, I, I, you know, as I said, I do think that the smaller, more nimble players have a good shot uh, in this environment and that uh, a Wilson Farm, you know, there could be other things like that that will crop up. How will the farmer's markets react? You know, can those be uh, handled in a way that, I mean, I think so, that allows people to stand six feet apart uh, wearing masks and so on, and that's, that's feasible. And we see already in, in Somerville and Cambridge, you have to have a mask uh, to go out in, in public. So I would think uh, farmer's market, as long as people weren't too crowded close together, would, um, would be okay. But I think we're gonna have rolling shortages, potentially, of things like meat or other oddball products that suddenly seem a little short on the shelf in the supermarket, and suddenly everybody you know, hears about it and makes a mad rush on it, and then, and then we're down. You know, for, for a month until it comes back again. So, uh, some of the changes I see. We have David uh, Don Cohn. Yeah. Um, okay. Wait a second. Thanks, David. That was great. Um, I was interested in you talking about the, the dangers of the just-in-time idea of supply. In fact, there was a. Uh, an economist on the radio this morning who talked about a shift from just in time to just in case. Yes. Um, but I guess what I want to get is your take on how likely is it that we'd make a larger shift that way, or how likely is it that it, when the crisis is over, people will kind of fall back into what seems the most efficient and in the short term most money making uh, strategy? A very fair question, Don. I, uh, I've certainly preached the gospel of just in time myself, and uh, you know it's a very widely accepted uh, driving principle, if you will, in supply chains around around the globe. Even though at the same time we have very far flung supply chains, so we're we're sourcing in this country more than ever, of course, from China. Very very lengthy supply chains, which are not very responsive and nimble but uh, by holding stocks and um, uh, going towards uh, e-commerce here, we're able to basically provide instant gratification. I mean, that's what consumers in the last 20 years or so have apparently been hankering for, is the ability to very, very conveniently place an order for whatever they want. And Amazon has now spoiled us all that, uh, yeah, you should be able to get that the next day. No questions asked, no, no problem. Well. Uh, you know, that, that um, has given rise to a, an efficiency focus, uh, this whole just-in-time, which works fine in normal times. That's the problem, you know. As soon as things go back to, quote, normal, there's going to be a lot of temptation to say, well, you know, that was the crisis, now everything's back again, we don't need to do it. anything. But I, I don't really think that's true. I think there's a lot of interest and greater awareness in companies today about the risk of going too far over uh, towards low cost and, uh, and uh, just in time, low inventory levels. It's also true that with interest rates so low right now, it costs a lot less to carry inventories than it used to. So, you know, a lot of this happened in the, uh, in the 80s, let's say, when interest rates were very high and was extremely expensive to hold on to inventory. I had a chance to talk to Tim Cook uh, years ago when he was the uh, supply chain head at Apple Computer, and he told me how they drove down their inventories, and I said, you know, what was the big benefit? And he said it wasn't so much uh, the inventory carrying cost, it was the ability to introduce new products faster, because they didn't have to flush all the old products out of the supply chain before they could introduce the, the iPhone uh, 11 in place of the 10. So, so there are many reasons why you generally want low levels uh, of stock throughout the supply chain. And that's going to be the very interesting challenge. We're, we're hoping we'll get some, some good business from companies because it's not easy to figure out you know, how you should shift that balance to really beef up 
uh, the security of the supply chain and take the risk out while at the same time not adding too much cost. I don't really think I answered you, but that's the considerations, I think. We have now Stephen. Yes. Um, thank you, Dave. It's really good. Uh, uh, view into things that uh, uh, we don't see very often and don't hear much about. Uh, my question is a follow-up on Marty's question, and it's a very disturbing question to me, uh, and it has to do with our consumerism. It has to do with that orientation for supply chains and everything that's involved in what you've talked about, and uh, it, comes, it basically comes down to what is, what is our collective role to make sure that not just in a crisis like this, but on an ongoing basis that everyone has housing, has food, uh, and uh, is able to have a job. And this food crisis, to see those, I mean, I can't, <laughs> I can't tell you how uh, the, uh, the depth of the tears <laughs> the, or the fluidity of the tears in watching those clips as we've all seen. You know, the fields being plowed under, the milk being going down. And we can say, well, there are two, as you've described very well, and it's a complicated situation to be sure, but there is something fundamentally wrong with the moral decision and, and our moral, well, if I, were to, if I were to quote an old mentor, Bill Coffin, who was uh, uh, rather prophetic, he said, basically, we're morally bankrupt if we allow that to happen. So question is, how do we not allow that to happen? Uh, it, it's a good question and, and a big one, Stephen. I, I really think of, of workers, particularly migrant workers in the fields and uh, people who are maybe not migrant, but are still very heavily immigrant folks at the lower end of the economic scale who work in, in these meat processing plants. It is tough, nasty uh, work uh, to do. And I think just as you said, these people are largely invisible to us. You know, our, our, we go to a lovely little shop like Wilson Farm, we look at the beautiful produce, we aren't really very directly confronted with that reality. I guess my, my hope would be seeing these people labeled essential workers uh, it, at least feels like a small step in the right direction and maybe with a change uh, in the fall uh, in our, uh, government, uh, we, we might actually be able to do some things to, to pay the right attention to the basic needs of these folks. I mean, I'm convinced that the reason why these meat plants have to close is not just because the workers are standing near each other, it's because they're all living in very cramped quarters, they're, they're sharing uh, uh, van loads, uh, you know, to get to work. So, I mean, it's not even sure that this uh, infections occur on the job, it could just be a re result of their living conditions, their poverty, their uh, very cramped uh, kinds of conditions, and lack of access to medical care, and uncertainty as to whether they'll be paid or not if they take sick leave. I mean, you know, why don't we have universal sick leave in this country? Why don't we, you know, that, these are all things we have to trade off against. Do, do we need, you know, one more cheap uh, piece, of, piece of clothing from, from China? I mean, it's, it's a moral, uh, issue at, at, for sure. Well, it has come to, to the end of the, the talk. David, thank you so much for, for your topic and everybody, thank you. Thank you here. all, great talking to you.